name is Daniel. Um, I'm a, oh, I should change it. I'm a lead developer advocate at New Relic. Um, I love hot pot and spicy food. I love spicy talks, spicy tweets. I like spicy anything. Um, I cannot handle the spice. It's just that I like to eat it for the pain. Um, <laughs> and I'm on Twitter, so feel free to follow me on Twitter. Um, but yeah, so today I'm going to very quickly go over what incident command looks like at New Relic. Also, these um, pictures that I have in these slides were really cute, like Home Alone gifts until my legal department striked it all down. So I had to replace it last minute um, with really ugly like stock images, so sorry about that. Um, and then, uh, so today in this talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about Log4j and how we can kind of discover vulnerabilities with certain technologies, uh, limits with traditional observability, and also the headliner, like Zan says, like uh, how eBPF can help you monitor in real time security threats. And uh, we're gonna finally wrap up with lessons learned. So yeah. <laughs> Example of ugly sock image picture. So <laughs> New Relic security team is an amazing team at New Relic that specializes in mitigating and remediating complex issues regarding security in our platform. Uh, we are hiring if you're a security person. So uh, <laughs> the security team prevents vulnerabilities and provides like, security education for our entire team. Um, they perform threat models, vulnerability research, and security reviews. And most importantly, they're the ones that uh, remediated our log4j security threat to make sure that all of our customers and our data was protected. So yeah, um, the security team never has an idea of what they're dealing with because every day it's different. Like the other day they were dealing with a threat, with, um, not a threat, but like a security issue with our swag site because someone like went in and hacked it and then just ordered us a lot of New Relic swag for themselves. And I was like, you can just come to one of our conferences. We have like thousands of stuff left over. We will just give it to you. <laughs> but someone hacked it for some reason. And then so that was like another threat that they dealt with. So they deal with a lot of weird incidents, but also very critical incidents, some more critical than others. Um, so they make a lot of cool decisions based on a hierarchical structure. And they're all informed by data, not gut reactions. And they always trust but verify all the information that they receive. Um, so yeah, everyone probably has heard about Log4j and how catastrophic that was in the security world. So I'm here to kind of talk to you a little bit more about the vulnerability, what hackers can do with Log4j, and also how you can kind of find vulnerabilities and then like, of course, patch them. So the reason that Log4j was such a big deal was because it's, it uses it was something called a remote code execution attack, which allows um, attackers to basically go into your code and then run their own code, which sounds very menacing, and it is, because it's the worst thing that you can possibly get in terms of an attack into your system, because they can just add code to your computer or your server, and then it can do whatever it wants. It could destroy it, it could send critical data to whatever place you want, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why Log4j was such a big deal. So let's talk about assessing the impact of Log4j. Like, what could an attacker do? Like, how widespread was it? And where do you begin looking and gathering data to figure out how much impact Log4j had in your organization. And also, how do we trust but verify? How do we demonstrate that services in our organization were unaffected and our customers had no data breached? So yeah, let's talk about a little bit about traditional observability since I'm from New Relic. Um, so when we talk about agents, um, it can be very limited in the uh, amount of information it can provide from a security point of view. So if you talk about observability from the standpoint of like adding an agent to whatever system you're running, it can give us specific jar files and JVM information. Um, but you can like mitigate parts of log4j by like looking at the number and then seeing if it's vulnerable or not. But it's very limited to discover like what it what a hacker actually did to your system. You can figure out, okay, they could have exploited this, but did they? Like you will never find out using traditional observability. The reason is because, of course, uh, traditional APM tools offer limited context. So if your APM instrumentation is not able to get the data you need, like you're basically blind because you can't just go and change source code to gather more data um, quickly because, I mean, the software shipping cycle is very, very um, slow. So if you don't get data you need to stop an attack, you cannot go back in time and add the code. That's the reason that uh, a lot of APM agents are very useful for certain things like performance, but not as useful for something like security. Also, um, most of our agents and things that we use for observability are all open source, which is great for collaboration and innovation, 
But it also means that attackers can go into the GitHub repo for all of these publicly and then figure out exactly what kind of data agents collect and then kind of go around it so they, uh, they can kind of bypass a lot of the observability you already have in your system so no one will ever know they took data. So basically, here's a diagram, a very scientific diagram I drew up of like how hacking might work in your application. So an application, let's say there's an application and the bad guys are attacking the particular app. And then what they can do is they can do very sneaky things to make it look like it's everyday normal activity when it's in reality sending data to a bad computer so they can make a lot of money. So you are kind of bamboozled because you think everything is normal and no one has exploited your application when in actuality they did. So this is an example of a way that hackers can be sneaky. So when you send data through HTTP requests, of course that will be picked up by APM agents. So a lot of hackers don't do that. A way that they can send data without you knowing is through DNS. So instead of sending data through HTTP, they can call a domain with the subdomain with the data that they're trying to get out. So for example, if they're trying to steal social security numbers, they could literally send a request to the social security number .evil.com, and then you can, they can still get the information without you knowing unless you were monitoring DNS. So yeah, a way that we can actually prevent hackers disguising things and then actually figure out what the hackers did was not looking at the application level, but the kernel level, which is kind of like the eye of Sauron, because it, you cannot trick the kernel because it is at the very lowest layer of your application. So if the kernel has seen that it, something is doing something weird, I mean, it's probably happened. So that's why you can use something called Pixie to uh, figure out things that have happened to your application that may have been masked by an attacker. So yeah. I'm super excited to introduce Pixie to y'all if you haven't heard of it already. It's a CNCF project donated by New Relic to the CNCF. Um, and yeah, it's a translation layer between eBPF data from the kernel to useful information that you can actually use because eBPF is just a lot of low level kind of code and information from the kernel. So yeah, like I talked about, if we um, go down the stack, it's harder to trick the system because you can't mask things when it's at that low of level. So it's really good to figure out what is exactly happening to your system when you may or may not know what is going on. So eBPF, quickly, is a really cool technology that allows programs to run without having to change the kernel source code or adding additional modules. So what this means is that you can actually get more data or gather more data without actually changing the source code because it's not using an agent to do monitoring. It's reading directly from the kernel. So if you want to figure out what's going on without deploying a new agent, you can just use eBPF because it reads directly from the kernel so you can get whatever data you need and query whatever you want. Um, so yeah, let's talk about a couple of scripts that you can run with Pixie that you possibly can detect the attacks that I talked about previously uh, um, and kind of go over the hacker trying to deceive you. So this is an example of a script you can run with Pixie that allows you to get raw DNS queries, which means that let's say you did an instrument, your application uh, with an agent that can detect DNS uh, or like, uh, like observe DNS. Well, with Pixie, you can actually at runtime just click the DNS script and get every single raw DNS query. So if you go see a DNS query to a weird website with a weird header, you can be like, oh, you know, the attacker is probably exploiting my system with DNS. Another cool thing that Pixie can do is a read raw HTTP calls that your application makes. So if your application is calling something that's not supposed to be, you can use this script. And because it gets it from the kernel layer through eBPF, you can get every single one, even the ones that the attackers are trying to mask, because you're getting it at the lowest abstraction layer. Um, the flame graph is really cool because you can see how functions uh, work so, uh, and how what calls what in the whole like, system. So if you wanted to see um, if the attacker was uh, executing remote code and then there was a function you don't recognize or a process that's running a lot longer than it should be, the flame graph is a good way to figure out, hey, something is not going right. Um, the NetFlow graph is really cool as well because it's another way to visualize DNS query just visually. So if you see something that's pointing to a node that is not supposed to be pointing to or an external node that you don't recognize, that's probably a security threat. Um, and the last really cool script that I wanted to go through was for SQL. 
So there's a lot of um, hackers that are exploiting and reading data they're not supposed to uh, in databases. So with the SQL script, you're able to actually read the raw SQL queries your systems are making to your SQL server. Um, and even if the SQL server is hosted externally, like with RDS on AWS, you're able to still read that because Pixie is able to pick up every query that goes in and out of your system, which means that with the SQL script, you're able to see every single query unedited that is made from your system to the database. So yeah, these are some of the scripts. You can, of course, even build your own. If you know a little bit of Python, there's a lot of functions that you can use to just build these scripts using pandas. So it's really, really awesome if you want to just have a bunch of data and then be able to query it to fit your own use case. So you can use it for security, like application performance management, whatever infrastructure, whatever you want to use it for. So here's a couple of lessons to wrap up my quick talk about eBPF and security. Um, so with traditional security, that is still really, really important with agents because it shows you what services are currently vulnerable and what you can do to fix it. And it allows you to quickly assess where to focus the efforts. But Pixie can tell you how the vulnerability may have been exploited and give indication to the business impact of the particular incident to see like what services were actually impacted and how are they impacted. So yeah, um, the Pixie, before Pixie, you had to kind of guess what the attackers might have done. But with Pixie, it takes the assumption out because you can in real time query like the data for what the attacker has done and how they have exploited your system. And it is very scriptable and flexible, so you can adapt it to whatever kind of threat, so you don't have to consistently change your observability strategy every time an attacker comes up with a new way to exploit your system. Um, also, it's a really, really easy way to give a clear risk assignment to uh, business leaders. So instead of saying, oh, an attacker might have uh, like exploited this particular vulnerability, you can be like, the attacker attacked this system to get this amount of data from our customers who are A, B, and C. So it's really good to give really good, clear risk assessments of vulnerabilities and attacks to leaders. So yeah, also um, it leads to like faster mean time to resolution. So if you have all of access to all of this kind of data, it becomes a lot faster and easier to resolve security incidents. So I mean, um, uh, tools like Pixie allow you to have a lot of flexibility um, on how you can get data and how quickly you can get data and hopefully resolve your security incident as fast as possible. So yeah, that's my talk. Hopefully that wasn't too long. And yeah, th thank you so much. Woo.